Welcome, everybody. I'm Jerry Menikoff. I'm the director of a, an office called the Office of Human Research Protections within the Department of Health and Human Services. And today, we're going to talk about institutional review boards. And my goal today, um, a lot of what I'm going to say is about a particular example, a particular story, a case study, something that really happened. And my goal is for you to understand why we have certain types of rules relating to protecting research subjects. And I hope by understanding this story, you could actually think better about why these rules exist, and it will actually give you enough background to reason about them and understand them in terms of applying them to your own work, your own research, whatever. So, okay. Um, Again, I want to make it clear, the usual disclaimer, any review, uh, views, opinions, et cetera, I give you are my own views and shouldn't represent the views of the Department of Health and Human Services or any other part of the federal government. So let's go on to the case study. Um, and this involves an ophthalmology type case. Um, so you'll learn a bit about uh, eyes and how eyes work. Um, so. Let's, yeah, okay. So we're going to talk in particular about the cornea. And you can see it here on this nice little diagram. Here's the cornea. It's the front part of the eye. Um, it's the part you see in the center. And it's clear. And most of what we're going to say relates to the fact that it's clear and how it stays clear. And as we're going to see, it, you probably could, could already guess this, it's actually fairly complicated for organic matter to actually produce something that is transparent. And yet the cornea manages to be transparent, which is a really good thing uh, in terms of our being able to see. So uh, now behind the cornea, you'll notice there's this compartment here that they call the aqueous humor. Uh, and it's a fluid-filled cavity. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the relevance of that in a moment. Um, the cornea is actually pretty thin. It's about a half a millimeter thick, and that will be relevant to what we're talking about, too, in a moment. Okay, so this is the little kind of picture of it. I'm going to give you some more background on it in some more slides. All right, okay. So this is a pathological specimen cutting through the cornea. On the top, um, that's the outside of the eyeball. So that's where your eye would be exposed to the air. And this was the cornea. Again, it's only a half millimeter thick. It looks gigantic here. And then on this side, this would be the aqueous humor. So this side of the cornea will be in contact with fluid. And remember, the big issue here is the cornea staying transparent. And for the cornea to be transparent, it actually needs the right amount of fluid in it. Okay, and I'll tell you more about that in a moment. So in terms of appreciating how this all happens, looking at the outside, this is the epithelium. So this is the outer layer. And you'll notice it looks you know, somewhat thick. Um, if you look at the, the dark dots, which are the nuclei, you can see that there are several cell, cell layers there. And let's compare it now on this side, the side next to that fluid-filled cavity, um, and if you look here, you can see a much thinner layer, and it looks like there was only an occasional single nucleus there. And that's because we're talking now about the endothelium. That is only one cell layer thick. And we now actually have a diagram of this, so we'll clarify it a little bit. So you can see the middle part is this giant thing they label stroma on the right side, and it notes that it's about right, a half a millimeter thick, uh, at least in the center of your cornea. It gets a little thicker at the edges. Uh, and right on the outside is the epithelium, a few cell layers thick, and then on the bottom there's the endothelium. Now notice it says correctly at the bottom that the endothelial cells, I guess it's really small, so it may be hard to read, uh, they regulate corneal transparency. So remember what I was telling you about, you got the fluid on the inside next to the endothelium, and on the outside you got the air. And we need the right amount of water in this corneal stroma for it to say transparent. Uh, and it's actually a hard thing to do. I mean, again, not many parts of our body are transparent, and there's a reason for that. Um, so if you don't have exactly the right amount of water, your cornea is not going to have that wonderful transparency, and you're not going to be able, to, or that person is not going to be able to see very well. 
So what role do the, the endothelial cells play in this, in, in making sure there's the right amount of water? So remember you have the aqueous humor next to them and gradually, you know, water will just diffuse into the stroma. That's what naturally will happen. Um, so the role of the endothelial cells is they actually have a bunch of pumps in them and they're busy pumping all the time, you know, kind of counteracting the tendency of the fluid to diffuse into the cornea. If the fluid did its own thing and just diffused into it, you'd have too much water in your cornea, you'd get what's called corneal edema and you wouldn't able to be able to see because your cornea will be far from transparent and I'll, I'll show you a picture of that in a moment. So, so here you have these wonderful, hard-working endothelial cells, and if they're doing their job correctly and everything's going beautifully, you'll have a very nice, you know, transparent cornea, and you'll see very well. And so this picture, and let me explain what you're seeing here. Imagine you were really, really tiny and in that fluid-filled compartment, the aqueous humor, and looking out. So, in front of you is this giant wall of these endothelial cells. And let me tell you a little bit more about the endothelial cells, because they're sort of interesting. Um, you know, when you're growing as a fetus, your endothelial cells develop, and at that point, you'll have all the endothelial cells you'll ever have for your entire life. They do not reproduce during your lifetime. So what happens at that point, basically, is uh, they form this layer, this one cell layer, that's fully separating the stroma from the aqueous humor uh, fluid-filled cavity. Um, and it's sort of hard to see here, but look at some of the smaller cells in this picture, because this is probably somebody who's older, uh, fairly old, and when you're born, again, you have the exact number of cells you'd have during your lifetime. Sometimes some of those cells will die. Well, if the cells die, remember, you want this kind of wall to be protecting, making sure not too much fluid uh, stays in, in the cornea. So over time, as some cells die, the surrounding cells basically spread out. You know, think of an amoeba, something like that. They just spread out their edges and get a little thinner and fill in the gaps. So they all start out and actually they're basically hexagonal when you're born and it all looks very, very beautiful and uniform. But over time, due to various stresses and lots of things can happen to your cornea, um, a lot of them may die, a fair number of them may die, and the others kind of spread out. And remember, there are only a certain number of them, and think of them as like workers, like people or something. Each of us can only do a certain amount of work, and if enough of them die, there's just so much work they could do in terms of pumping out all that fluid. And so eventually, you're gonna reach a point where they're not able to pump out enough fluid, so basically the diffusion is gonna overwhelm their ability to do pumping, and at that point, you're gonna have corneal edema. Um, they're just not enough of them to do the job. And again, you could see it from this slide. You'll see, right, some of them are fatter, and in fact, the bigger ones are the ones that probably look less hexagonal, because what happened is some of their neighbors died and they had to spread out, and when they spread out, they're obviously no longer exactly hexagonal. But again, they all started out sort of smaller and hexagonal. So I mean, it's a very sort of beautiful concept, and all these hardworking cells doing their thing. So anyhow, this is a problem, obviously, when you get corneal edema, and we actually do have treatments for it, and that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about a standard treatment for corneal edema. And um, here's part of it. So we're going to talk about, here's part of how you treat it, we're going to talk about uh, doing a corneal transplant. And people have, you know, physicians have been doing corneal transplants for decades. Um, in fact, when you think of transplants, I mean, I guess it gets into what you consider an organ, uh, but if you're considering a cornea an organ, uh, there are, it's probably like the number one type of transplant because there are lots and lots of corneal transplants that take place. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit more about what a corneal transplant involves, and then we're going to talk about a doctor or physician who tried to improve the techniques for doing a corneal transplant. So anyhow, in terms of the, the usual way you do a corneal transplant, um, you get a cornea from a deceased person. So you would have a donor, and what you would do is you'd, you'd get their eyeball, and you'd cut out the cornea very crudely. You'd cut out the white part so the cornea is kind of stuck in the middle. And then you'd look at, at what we have here, and you'd plop it into this little dish so that the cornea is sort of sitting in the dish. And then what this is is what we call a tree fine. 
and just a fancy name for sort of a scalpel or a type of cutting device. And it's basically, um, uh, if you imagine a thimble like for sewing and you just cut off that, that hard tip and then you polish the edges of it, and that's pretty much the size of it too. And so, you know, this is not all that sophisticated in terms of what you actually do here. You put that sort of piece of cornea in the little bowl here and then you put this piece on top of it and you kind of press down and that little tree vine will cut a round circular you know, piece of the cornea. And the piece of the cornea you're going to cut out is often called a corneal button because it actually is the size pretty much of uh, a button on you know, a shirt, something like that. Um, so that's how you produce the donor piece of the cornea. What you will then do in terms of doing the transplant is on the patient, you will actually cut out in an operating room a similar hole um, in their eyeball and you basically plop that little button into that hole and then you're going to sew it in place. And what we're going to talk about now is how you sew it in place and, and exactly how that's done and possible ways to improve that procedure. So on the left side here, you see an edematous cornea. Hopefully it's pretty obvious that that person is not going to see very well at all. And on the right, you see a person who received a corneal transplant. Notice how it's pretty clear looking through that, that transplant. So that's, again, when the procedure works very, very well. And again, it works very, very well for tens of thousands of patients. Um, it's a good procedure. Um, it's, it's actually pretty amazing in many regards that you could just cut that piece out, put in the piece from a donor, and it actually works and lives and does its thing. And the epithelial, the epithelial cells are fine, endothelial cells are fine. Um, quite amazing. But so now let's talk about um, what the surgeon does, what the ophthalmologist does in terms of sewing that corneal button into place. And there are two types of sutures that are used commonly or have been used for a while. Um, and I'm going to talk about both of those. Um, and on this, only one set of them is shown in this diagram. I'm going to show you another picture with the other type of suture. But often both of them are used in the same procedure, and that's what we're going to talk about. So in this, in this picture, you're seeing what can be called radial or interrupted sutures. So each of these is a separate little suture. And basically all it is is, you know, a piece of you know, suture material that is tying from the inside, which is the donor's cornea, to the outside, which is the patient's own cornea. And so there are a number of these, right, about 16 of them or so, uh, four in each quadrant in this scenario. Um, and let's see if we want the next one. Okay, so what I'm describing here is what could be called standard care. And, and we could use that concept in both a legal and an ethical context, that this is the usual way that this type of procedure is done. We think it's probably the best way to do it at the moment, as far as we know. And if you had corneal edema and you went to an ophthalmologist, Presumably, this is the sort of thing that the doctor would usually do. And we're going to supplement this slide over the next few minutes with two other categories. Uh, one of them will be doing research. And you'll see there'll be a third category I want to talk about, because I think talking about that third category is helpful in terms of our understanding why we have rules relating to research. Now, before I get on to, to what this particular researcher tried to do, let me just get back to how the cornea functions. Um, obviously it has to be clear so the light could go through and eventually hit the retina, which is where you kind of do your seeing part and our nervous system sort of interacts with it. But um, another thing to understand is the cornea itself also refracts the light, it bends it. Um, so it's actually the biggest focusing part of your eyeball. Um, the lens gets a lot of the credit and perhaps too much of the credit because the cornea actually is more powerful than the lens in terms of focusing the light. The lens is needed because the lens could change shape and therefore it could allow us to focus close up or far away depending on what we want to look at. But the cornea actually has the biggest role in terms of just bending the light in the first place so that we can, with the lens's help, uh, focus an image on the retina. Um, and so let's now get back to more about the sutures. Okay, 
So remember I told you there were the interrupted sutures, and now I'm going to tell you about one other part type of suture. And again, in these procedures, often you'll use both types of sutures, and I'll tell you why in a second. But here you have another suture, and this is basically a running suture. And this is all one suture that basically uh, the surgeon is going from one part of the eye and, and they just circle around and around and around, going, connecting from the, the recipient's part of the cornea to the donor's part of the cornea. And you can see there are quite a few passes there. Um, the suture material you're using is very, very fine. In fact, you know, we wouldn't be able to see it unless you were looking at it under an operating microscope. And because it's so fine, you have to be really delicate when you're doing these passes. Um, and in fact, you don't want it to break. Because if it breaks, what you basically have to do is you have to kind of pull out the piece that you put in there and start all over again. And in fact, if you look at around, what is it, around 9 o'clock or so, you'll see that You'll see that little ball. And all that is is where the knot was actually tied. So basically, the, the surgeon went all the way around, 360 degrees, and eventually tied the beginning piece to the end piece. Now, remember I was telling you the cornea uh, focuses the light. In fact, it's more powerful than the lens. Well, it's somewhat hard for the surgeon to make sure you're getting exactly the right amount of tension in every single one of those passes. And often it's the case that you may get a little more tension in some parts than other parts. Well, remember, given that the cornea has all this focusing power, too much tension in some places versus other places makes the curvature of the cornea different in different places. And for any of you who have ever worn glasses or contact lenses, you're probably familiar with the concept of astigmatism, just a fancy name for the fact that in different planes, your, your cornea and the lens has different amounts of focusing power, and we could correct for that by having somebody wear glasses or a contact lens. Well, you, your res, the ideal result in terms of doing this procedure is basically to end up with the same amount of refractive power in every single axis, but often you're not going to get that. So now remember, I told you about the interrupted sutures. Imagine there were all a bunch of those 16 interrupted sutures here. So to the extent there was too much tension in one or another place, what the surgeon can do after the procedure, um, it could take you know, one, two, three months while the, the cornea is healing. The, they'll be testing, and you can do sophisticated testing and get wonderful color-coded maps of the curvature of the cornea. If there's too much tension in certain places, you could basically cut some of the interrupted sutures and release the tension in those parts of, of the cornea. So that's one of the things that is commonly done. So now, imagine you're somebody out there, and you're looking at all this, and you're saying, well, gee, you know, it takes a while. Look at that. It probably takes a surgeon a while. We're not talking about a huge amount of time, but, you know, 10 minutes or something. But that could add up in terms of how expensive operating room time is, whatever it is, to do that. And plus, there's then the recovery and the need to cut the sutures. And maybe you'd want the person to be able to see a lot better a lot sooner so they wouldn't have to wait one, two, three months for this healing to, to occur and to make sure the curvature is okay. So you might think about, is there a way to do this in a better way? Um, and that's what we're gonna talk about, our researcher. So this is a, a Dr. James Rousey uh, at the University of South Florida, and he had an idea. It was an interesting idea about how to improve this procedure. Uh, didn't work out exactly as he wanted to do, but that isn't to say it wasn't a good idea. Um, and so let's explore that a little bit. And there's Dr. Rousey. Uh, and remember I was telling you about the tree find, right? That little dish and the little cutting tool. And he, his new idea involved a different type of tree find. He was redesigning the tree find. And there he is showing it. And um, his university was in Tampa. Um, if you ever invent anything, right, one of the cool, important things is you want to give it a catchy name. So he called it the Tampa Tree Find. Um, and he was very happy at that point. He wasn't always so happy about this down the road. Um, so he got a patent, and, and so let's talk about the patent a little bit. Uh, see, it's a patent for sutureless corneal transplant techniques because, remember, the, the problem to some extent is that you're doing all the suturing and it's creating the tension that's different you know, in one axis than another. So, okay, let's think about could we do this without needing any sutures? And that's what he thought of doing. 
And so he said we'd come up with this right, technique for transplantation in a much safer way with far less complications than previous methods. Um, so that was the goal, and, and let's see what happened. But certainly it's a good goal, and again, it was, it was certainly true in a lot of other procedures in, in you know, this was not off the wall in terms of ophthalmologic procedures, many procedures that did need sutures in the past. For example, you know, removing a cataract now are often done without sutures. So we was going in the same direction with a lot of other stuff. So this was in 1996. Um, this was the diagram uh, that he submitted as part of the patent application. So let's just get a sense of what's going on here. So this is the patient's cornea. And remember I said you cut out a hole so that you'll plop the donor cornea in there. So this is the donor cornea. Now, just to get a sense of the scale of this, remember from top to bottom, that's about a half a millimeter. So this is really, really blown up a lot. This looks like a huge hole here, but again, that's only a half a millimeter. Um, so you'll see the new thing here where these tabs, and, and they're right on the top, the outside part of the cornea. And he designed it so that they would be about a tenth of uh, the thickness of the cornea. And you could realize that's really, really thin, and it's not easy to actually cut something. Remember, this is really fine material. Um, and it's sort of interesting. The way he actually managed to, to, to create the tree find, uh, around the area around Tampa, there were actually engineers who had been involved in doing stuff for the U.S. government in terms of you know, making nuclear bombs and that sort of thing, and the government was no longer doing that, and it was trying to phase them out into to nice, you know, wonderful civilian-type employment. And some of those engineers actually were involved in creating a device that could actually cut uh, the corneal button in a way that actually had those tabs on it. And, um, and apparently they were able to do that. And in terms of what's happening here, the way I think about it a little bit, I don't know if people still have like paper dolls and that sort of stuff, that you were kind of creating these little kind of tabs on the donor cornea, and the surgeon will just make these little slits in the patient's own cornea and plop the button in there and then just stick the tabs into the, the slots created by the slits. And you do this, and you wouldn't need to put in any sutures. So that was the premise. And we're going to talk about how things worked out. But it's an interesting idea. And yeah, if everything went well, it's certainly something we'd like to be able to do to eliminate the need for sutures. So what happened? So he first, Dr. Rousey first started studying this in cats. And then he began using it in human beings. And he never filed with an institutional review board. And this lecture is about institutional review boards. I haven't told you what they are. Uh, I will tell you a lot about them in the second half. Uh, but for the moment, they're a type of committee uh, that reviews research studies to make sure they're conducted in compliance with the applicable regulations. And that's what we're going to explore. Why do we need IRBs? What do they do? Uh, why? Can't we have some other regulatory apparatus instead of IRBs? But for whatever, he never filed with the IRB. And I'm going to ask you, and we'll explore, a particular question about what he did. Um, so as I kind of hinted at, he ran into some problems here. Things didn't work out exactly the way he wanted them to do. So here's a headline from USA Today in 2001. So right, in 1994, James Rousey invented this medical device, right? He thought he'd revolutionize corneal transplant surgery. Um, he thought he'd make millions of dollars. Um, his device didn't end up doing either of those things. He lost his university job. Um, and there were federal findings that he performed unapproved research on more than 60 people, including children. And, and certainly all of that sounds very bad, but let's try to explore exactly what was bad about what he did. And I'm going to actually ask you to think about perhaps changing what he did and seeing whether it would have been as bad as what he actually did do. 
and, and this is just in terms of uh, the Office for Human Research Protections, the office I currently run, um, actually made some findings about this back in 2000, um, and this is what they said in terms of the bad things he did, that he proposed a randomized trial and never conducted it, uh, that he used a new untested technique in 60 people and presented abstracts of his results at meetings. And so what OHRP then concluded, this is the systematic collection of data, um, and it meets the definition of doing research. And we're going to see that's important because there's act an actual definition in the rules that says, here's what it means for purposes of these rules to be doing research. Here's when you're doing research, and we're going to take it as a given for now that, okay, let's assume OHRP was right in saying, given what he actually did, given that he kind of designed this randomized trial. So he was at one point contemplating uh, his patients who had randomized them, and half of them would have gotten the usual technique, the standard care I described to you before, and half of them would have gotten his new idea with the little tabs and everything. Um, and he proposed doing that, but he didn't do it. Um, and so in any event, the OHRP concluded this was research. He did research, he didn't run the research through an IRB, and that appeared to be a violation of the rules. And one of the consequences of this was that OHRP went to the institution he was practicing at, uh, University of South Florida, and told them that you now have to make sure that the patients know that they were research subjects and that they underwent experimental surgery and right, all the rules weren't followed. And as you could probably appreciate, this is not something that university was particularly happy about telling these people. You kind of immediately, they're thinking, well, lawyers are going to get involved in, in lots of lawsuits and, and bad things. Okay, so now let's try to put this all in place and, and see why we're talking about this stuff. And remember I told you about standard care, and hopefully it's a concept that you're pretty familiar with, right? If you're a healthcare provider in any field, you learn about um, the way to provide standard care. In fact, I think in many ways, you know, I often said, you know, 99% of medical school, for example, or nursing school, whatever it is, is in a sense about ethics because it's teaching you the types of ways of treating people that our society views as ethically appropriate. Um, so it's sort of how ethics merges with the actual science of, of how to treat people. Um, you're sort of, as part of licensing, whatever it is, in general you're going to give people standard care and you're able to treat people in the first place or society allows you to practice medicine, nursing, whatever, uh, precisely because you're appropriately trained so that you will do the right thing in terms of treating people. So hopefully it's pretty straightforward, that's standard care. Um, on the bottom is, is the notion of doing research and we're going to talk about that. Again, Dr. Rousey, he was the findings were made that he was doing research, and that gets into, well, what are the rules relating to doing research? And I want to now talk about the middle category, because I think understanding that there is a middle category is actually helpful in getting a better, you know, I don't know, more sophisticated understanding of why would we have rules protecting research subjects. And so I want you to view these, and I'll explain more about what fits into each, as three distinct categories. Um, there's the notion of doing, giving somebody standard care, not in a research setting, but outside of research. There's the notion of giving somebody non-standard care. Again, you're not in research, because research is the third category. So we're going to say a little more about that middle category, and that's actually why I'm explaining what happened to Dr. Rousey, because his scenario helps to understand what this middle category might mean. And as we're going to discover, a lot of people have actually talked about the middle category and reasoned about it, but perhaps not even thinking that they were talking about the middle category. So let's explore that a little bit. Um, and in particular, Dr. Rousey's defense, because when he was initially accused of all of this, and people said, wow, you know, you did research, and he said, well, hold on a second. No, I actually wasn't doing research. And what he specifically said was that the technique was never used on my patients as part of any systematic investigation. 
And again, I'm going to give you, a, you know, shortly a definition of what we have in our regulations now in terms of when are you actually doing research with somebody, but it is a formal definition. And part of it is that, yes, you're only doing research if you're doing a systematic investigation. And so his response was, gee, what's a systematic investigation? I wasn't investigating anything. I wasn't doing research at all. Therefore, I couldn't have been violating the research rules because if I'm not in research, if I'm not doing research, there are no rules applying to me. Um, and in fact, what he's basically saying is he might have been in that middle non-standard care category. So let's get a better sense of what that might involve. Um, and we'll do that in a moment. Um, so let me add an additional question here. As this was all happening, there seemed a lot of interest in concluding and proving that he was doing research. And so you might ask yourself, well, why was everybody so interested in concluding that he was doing research? And so there seemed to be perhaps some concern that if you didn't plop him into this doing research category, maybe what he was doing was perfectly legitimate and didn't violate any rules. And so let's kind of alter the actual underlying facts. Because remember, conclusions were determined that he was on the research side of things. And so I want you to think for a while Imagine a different scenario in which what he originally did, and let's assume you could change the facts enough so that he actually wasn't doing research, but he was still using this new innovative technique on his patients. And there are th different facts you could change here. So imagine that he kept no research records and merely told the patients each time that this was a new experimental technique and he thought it was the best thing for them. Okay, so he's not trying to do anything systematic. It's just that Dr. Rousey happens to be the one doctor around there, around anywhere, who thought of a different technique. And when a patient comes to him and wants a corneal transplant, he says, by the way, I happen to be the one person who developed this new technique, and I understand, and I want you to understand, it's experimental, not a lot of proof about how well it works, but I happen to think it's a really good technique, and here's why it might be a, a good thing for you to undergo instead of the usual method. And he, again, didn't keep any records, never thought about doing a randomized trial. So just imagine you could change enough of the facts so that he's not on the research side of things. And again, there is an actual regulation that's explains when you're on one side or the other. So it's not off the wall to assume he could actually change the facts so that he was on one side of it, on the non-research side. And so remember, he might have then been in that middle category, because clearly what he was giving the patients was not standard care, right? We explain what standard care is. Standard care is cutting out the little button, plopping it in, doing the interrupted sutures, doing the running suture. He was not doing any of that. He was using no sutures. But again, if he's not in the research realm, He's providing some kind of clinical care. It's not standard care. It's that middle category of providing non-standard care. And that's what we want to explore. What are the rules relating to providing non-standard care? Um, and so this is the, in particular the question I want us all to think about. If he was just giving non-standard care, would that have been OK? Was there anything problematic in terms of what he was doing? And in particular, what are the rules that apply to that scenario? How do we determine whether he was doing anything wrong or not? Presumably we're not under research regulations because we concluded under this scenario he's not doing research. He's doing some other funky sort of thing. And so perhaps the only problem in all of this was that Dr. Rousey was careless in terms of doing too many research-like things, too many things that put him on the side of doing research. But had he not done those things but still ended up using his technique on these patients, he might have been in this non-standard care category, and he might have been fine, that it was perfectly acceptable for him to do that. And that's what the question we want to talk about right now. And before we answer that question, I want to tie this in to a debate that actually has been occurring for, for decades. Um, and this is sort of a standard scenario. You may have heard about it, or maybe not. but. Often a lot of people who are not thrilled about our rules relating to protecting research subjects, from time to time they come up with a particular argument about why they're problematic. And uh, this is one take on it from Bob, Bob Trug. Um, he's a very well-known uh, ethicist and uh, anesthesiologist um, at Harvard. Uh, he, I think he speaks in this series or in the other 
right, ethics series uh, at NIH from time to time. And he's talking about a paradox. He wasn't the one who came up with this. Others have talked about this. But he did write this up in the New England Journal about 15 years ago. And so it's worth uh, looking at what he says here. So uh, he's comparing two scenarios. Imagine a physician reads about a new method for treating patients. And one scenario is the, patient may, the physician may read about it and say, okay, I'm going to just start doing it to my patients. I think this sounds like a good technique. It's a new technique. Maybe it's not proven, but it sounds reasonable to me. And as long as my patients have given general consent for this, I could go ahead and do, do this new technique, use it on them. On the other hand, if I want to actually do a randomized controlled trial to determine whether this technique or the standard technique is better, and, and here he's giving a particular example, like which of two widely used antibiotics is more effective at treating bronchitis. If you want to do the randomized controlled trial, and a lot of us might say, well, gee, certainly doing the randomized controlled trial is a better thing from a broad ethical viewpoint than just kind of starting to use it on your patients, because now you're actually trying to generate information in the gold standard way we actually try to answer a research question. So right, if you're actually trying to do what he's indicating, and a lot of us would agree with, is sort of the better way to go forward. Um, you have to prepare a formal protocol. You'd have to obtain approval from an IRB. You'd have to seek written informed consent from potential participants. So bottom line, you have to go through all of these procedural tasks when he's saying, in contrast, if you didn't even try to do any of that, you could just go ahead and use it on all your patients, and you don't have to even go near an IRB. And that sounded kind of puzzling to him. And it may sound puzzling to you, too. It's an interesting argument. And, and this is just restating the argument in fewer words. Um, physicians can do almost anything they want in the name of therapeutic innovation, but only if there is no attempt to gain systematic knowledge from the intervention. Or, his final restatement, I need permission to give a new drug to half my patients, but not to give it to all of them. Stated that way, that sounds like a pretty good argument, right? Why do we have these stupid rules that are causing people to have to go through these hoops when they're actually trying to do something the right way? They actually want to do a randomized controlled trial. We're, we're here at the NIH or in cyberspace, whatever, and we're kind of thinking, well, of course, doing randomized trials is a great thing, and yet why do we impose all these obstacles on doing that um, as compared to somebody who would just go ahead and give it to his patients? And that gets back to that sounds, I guess, paradoxical, as he said. What's the rationale for this? Um, and so let's ask ourselves, is he right about this? That, again, physicians could do anything they want in terms of therapeutic innovation, but only if there's no attempt to gain systematic knowledge. Um, and I want to try to at least argue and hopefully convince you um, that, no, he's not right. And to understand why he's not right, you actually have to understand the rules relating to the three categories I described to you. So we've already gone over the rules relating to standard care, and now we're going to talk about the rules for that middle category of non-standard care. And notice that that's what Trug is talking about here, right? He's talking about, he's comparing two scenarios, one in which you're doing research, and that gets into, well, what should the rules be about doing research? And then the other comparator category is he's talking about some position and just kind of using something in a non-standard way um, in order to, right, outside of a research setting. And so the question is, what are the rules relating to non-standard care? And so to understand why we have rules relating to research, why we have IRBs, we need to spend a few minutes understanding the rules for non-standard care. And so here I'm trying to sort of explain some of these rules. So for standard care, the general rule is that the patient is number one. And all I'm trying to do here is probably restate a rule you learned from the first time you encountered anything relating to healthcare and healthcare ethics. And this is the standard Hippocratic Oath, right, that basically care providers are supposed to be doing what is best for their patients. The patient is number one. You know, Hippocrates and all that good stuff. And what I want to argue is that if you're not in the research setting, there are a standard set of rules that apply both legally and ethically. Pretty much they're all on board in terms of going in the same direction. And the notion is that the patient is number one. Whatever you as a healthcare provider are trying to do should be in the best interests of your patient. 
And I haven't explained the research rules for the moment, but we'll get to those. And so now let's apply this to the scenario of Dr. Rousey. Um, Okay, so what happens if a doctor fails to follow the patient is number one rule, and certainly as a legal matter, you're committing malpractice generally. If you're not doing what's in the best interest of your patient, that's why we have something called tort law, and so we're often in, you know, these are creations of each particular state, but they all have some form of, of tort law, and malpractice is just a type of tort law that is applied to people in a particular profession. Um, and right, if you're not doing what's best for your patient, you're violating the patient is number one rule and you're committing malpractice. And, and let me detour here a little bit and people might say, well, what about the fact that what if the doctor actually got the patient to consent to whatever he or she is doing? And does that fully absolve the doctor? And in general, no, it doesn't. And then let me just give you an example so we'll have a sense of this. And um, there was a woman, Barbara Rojas, this is a few years ago. Um, she was in her 50s, and, and she was quite you know, uh, dedicated in terms of she was very overweight, but she managed to, to lose a, that massive amount of weight. I mean, it took a lot of you know, dedication for her to manage to do this. Well, often when you lose a massive amount of weight, you could get this sort of pendulous skin hanging off your body, and, and it's... it's not a good thing in a variety of ways. And she wanted this skin removed so she could actually you know, be attractive and, and get the benefits of having lost all that weight. Um, she happened to be originally, she was in California when all this was happening, somewhere in that part of the country. Um, and she was not particularly well to do. And this is extremely expensive surgery and she didn't have any insurance. Um, so. It was known among other people who had emigrated to the U.S. from, from Ecuador um, that there was this Dr. Guillermo, Guillermo Falcone who had a, a, you know, a license in Ecuador and was trained there, but he wasn't licensed as a physician in the U.S., but people in this community knew you could go to him and he would be cheaper than going to a, a U.S. licensed physician. And she went to him. Uh, he explained that he could do it, but he'd have to do it in her bedroom. Uh, again, he didn't have any license. He certainly couldn't do it in, well, he couldn't do any medical practice in the U.S., but he nonetheless did it in her bedroom. Um, a few days after the surgery, um, she ended up hemorrhaging. It was quite awful because her daughter was around at the time and saw this happening, called 911, and, I mean, she just bled to death before they were able to, you know, treat her. Um, she ended up dying and he ended up going to jail. Now clearly this is a very extreme case. Uh, not a lot of physicians who commit malpractice go to jail, but nonetheless this is just establishing the principle that our society in terms of healthcare provision is quite paternalistic in a variety of ways. And so just the fact that you kind of give consent, it's not that people could give consent to anything. And so now let's apply some of this to Dr. Rousey's scenario. Um, he was sued by at least two patients that claim malpractice. And let's ask ourselves what rules would apply in that scenario. And remember, I was suggesting the rules are actually no different than would have applied if he had provided standard care. Instead, he provided non-standard care. And the question should be, in terms of the best interests of the patient, was it reasonable for him to be departing from standard care and instead providing this particular type of non-standard care? Um, that's a hard question to answer, and I'm not pretending to give you an answer to that, but I'm just wanting you to understand, if you're in that non-standard care category, you are still under the rules relating to you have to do what is best in terms of the best interest of the patient. The patient is still number one. And so the question would be, was it reasonable to do this sort of funky new type of surgery? And what would actually happen in the courtroom in terms of analyzing that, you would look at the risks versus the benefits of switching from the standard procedure to the new procedure. And we could discuss this during the questions. If you want to, there are some arguments on one side or the other. And we could go through the various permutations about what might happen in that sort of resolving that sort of lawsuit. So now let's go back to our three scenarios um, and trying to tie it in to what Bob Drew was saying. Um, so bottom line, it isn't 
true, okay, that you could have just given any type of non-standard care to your patients. Uh, when you give non-standard care to your patient, the patient is still number one. You have to follow that rule. On the other hand, in the research setting, we've actually modified the rules, and we've modified the rules in a very, very significant way. Uh, the patient is no longer number one. And this is a really, really big deal, because right, that's a departure from the number one rule of medical ethics. And bottom line is we have research rules precisely because we want to allow the deviation, the relaxation from the usual rules. And I think it's something worth thinking about, because often people will think about research rules and they'll say, well, the research rules are often stricter than the rules in clinical care, and actually it's just the opposite. We've actually relaxed the usual protections we give to patients when they become research subjects, and we've come up with a, an alternative set of rules. And now we're going to kind of go into some of the details of that. But I think this is the premise that a starting point in terms of you could think about why we have these rules in the first place. And once you kind of think about what happened to Dr. Rousey in that scenario and his possible arguments about I wasn't doing research, think about what set of rules he would have been under there and then compare it to what rules we have for research. Um, so why do we have the special research rules? Research involves a conflict of interest. And the researchers pursuing two goals, and, and this is not true again of obviously every research study, but I'm particularly talking about research studies where you're actually providing some type of treatment, so like a randomized trial where somebody actually has a medical problem and you're testing a new type of treatment. Um, and so the researchers pursuing the two goals, trying to answer the research question, and again, sometimes in certain types of studies, treating the patient. And the bottom line is that these two goals can conflict. And we actually want research to take place, right? We're here at the NIH, obviously the heart of a lot of wonderful research. Uh, it's in all of our interests to have lots and lots of important research taking place, but we want to make sure it occurs under appropriate protections, that, that the ethics is all taken care of. Well, in order for the research to take place, um, we allow the researcher to do a variety of things, and in particular, one of the things I want to emphasize is, and this is not always true, but in certain studies, the researcher is allowed to do things that can, in fact, be bad for the patient. Um, not in every study, and, and even in the studies where it is done, it may not be that bad for the patient. It depends on the facts of the study. But the bottom line is, being in the special category of doing research does, again, actually free up the researcher from 100% compliance with the usual rules of everything you do has to be in the best interest of the patient. And these are examples of probably the four categories of differences between research and just providing standard clinical care to somebody where it can do things that are not necessarily in the patient's best interest, in this case, the subject's best interest. So randomization, okay? And this is one we could actually explore a long time because this is debated a lot. But the bottom line is, if you think back about any care you've gotten in the hospital, from a doctor, whatever, um, it's rare that the physician is going to just say, well, gee, you know, there are two treatments for your medical problem. Let's flip a coin and, and just pick whichever one that, you know, heads comes up. I pretty sure none of you has encountered that in terms of clinical care. And there's a reason we don't do that. Um, because in general, even if we're not certain, and, and I should highlight, there's actually a very vigorous debate out there right now about our research rules, and this is sort of one of the themes of it. Well, how bad is randomization for people? And, and again, the argument is, well, we're not too sure which of these treatments is best. Yeah, it's not a bad thing to actually randomize somebody just in terms of their best interests. Well, in the real world, when we're not in research, again, you have not seen your doctors doing that. And again, I think there's a legitimate reason why they don't do that, because even if we're not sure which of two, two techniques is best, we often have some hypothesis or some evidence leaning a certain way, or just the way we reason about the differences between the two treatments, we'll use a lot of tentative information, or even a little tentative information, and we'll, we'll make our best guess as to which is best, and probably have a conversation with a patient too. But one way or another, again, in the face of, you know, 
you know, tentative information, whatever, inadequate information. Uh, we often do try to use that inadequate information one way or another. And certainly, if the patient has a very serious medical problem, you want to use whatever information you have to take a best guess. So that's the argument, the counter argument in terms of why just saying, well, we're not sure which is better, so how could there be any risk for randomization? Yeah, I mean, there can be risks if by randomizing, we're denying, we're ignoring the tentative information that's out there. Uh, when you go to a movie, you don't just kind of flip a coin and go to whichever movie, you know, the coin flip picks. You may not end up picking a movie that you really like, but generally you know what kind of movies you're more likely to like, and you use that information. So that's the way we work in general, number one. Number two, standardization. Um, in terms of our gold standard of randomized clinical trials, we want the only differences between the two groups, group A and group B, whatever you randomize to, to largely be about the treatment the treatment A versus the treatment B. So we want to minimize all the other things happening to people. So to get rid of all the rest of that noise, one of the things we like to do is basically make sure everything else is standard. So all the general ways that, so we protocolize. We have a protocol and the protocol tells the ways to treat the person. So a lot of things that we otherwise might allow a physician to vary in terms of how much, patient, how much pain the patient is having, we allow the doctor to titrate to figure out which painkillers they want to use, whatever else. Um, the, there may be very good reasons for the protocol to actually put limits within some degree on that. Again, usually they're not op absolute limits, but there is some degree of standardization. Um, and again, in general, were you not in the research study, your physician would be, be doing a number of things in terms of picking, you know, on a lot of, you know, pain control, everything else, picking different variations on your treatment. Number three, non-disclosure of interim results. Um, often, again, physicians use whatever information is available. You may be conducting this clinical trial, and it could be that halfway through the clinical trial, the evidence is usually leaning in favor of one treatment, you know, not being the one that's going to win out. You may not sure the other one is better than it, but you're pretty sure this one is never going to be, it may be as good as the other, but it's not going to be any better. If you disclose that to the people in the clinical trial, and let's assume they have a really bad problem, they have an untreatable form of cancer, they would quickly switch out of the trial if they learned that they were actually getting the treatment that looks like it's going to be the loser. But we don't tell them that because we know disclosure to interim results can cause them to want to leave the trial. And finally, number four, probably the most common one you hear, often in clinical trials, we will do a number of things to generate information that will be used by the researchers, but it may not alter the treatment of the patient. So it's purely for research purposes. We may be doing a bunch of extra CAT scans. We may be doing lumbar punctures. We could be doing things that are, you know, somewhat, you know, I don't know, harmful, but they could be painful, they could be uncomfortable, uh, they could expose the person to a lot of radiation. And again, we do these things, they, they, we do them legitimately because we want to answer the research question, but it may not be in the best interest of the patient. So just some examples of the sort of things we do. And bottom line, these are all things that are violating that Hippocratic Oath, that rule that the patient is number one. And so why do we have the research regulations? We want to manage the conflict of interest, okay? On the one hand, we know we've relaxed that rule that, hey, you know, you always have to look at a patient as number one, but we're a little uncomfortable about relaxing that rule, and we want to put limitations on how much we relax it. So what the research rules do is basically they make sure that allowing researchers to go ahead and answer the research question and to free them up from the obligation to always do everything that's in the best interest of the patient, that by being freed up in that way, we're not allowing them to do too much in terms of harming the patients, that we're not going to inappropriately override the patient's interests. So bottom line, these rules are basically balancing the ability of allowing the researchers to go forward and do all that important research, but not take inappropriate advantage of the research subjects. So why do we need these sorts of rules? Some examples. Here's high altitude experiments where experimental subjects were placed in low pressure chambers and the simulated altitude raised. Freezing experiments, subjects were put in a tank of ice water for up to three hours, kept naked outdoors at below freezing temperatures. Um, 
self experiments, wounds were deliberately inflicted on subjects, and they injected bacteria into them, and they stopped the blood circulation, and they did other things to aggregate the infections, and then they tested treatment with sulfur drugs. Finally, experiments with poisons. Uh, research was done to see the effect of poisons on human beings. The subjects were secretly administered poisons, and they died as a result of the poisons or were killed in order to permit autopsies. Um, you may have figured out these were all examples of things that did happen uh, you know, under Nazi uh, regimes. Um, and the result of all of that was, was leading to the Nuremberg Code in the 1940s after the end of, of World War II. Um, and I have a number of slides here that describe the Nuremberg Code. Don't worry about reading all of this, but the Nuremberg Code is certainly worth looking at if you haven't. It's very short. It only has 10 points to it. And a lot of what our current rules do is actually embedded in one way or another in concepts that were in the Nuremberg Code. And one of the more interesting things is almost every provision of the Nuremberg Code is brief, like two or three lines of these 10 provisions. And the only one that's longer than that is the first, and that the voluntary consent of the human subject is absolutely essential. That is so core to our thinking that one of the, the greatest protections you could ever get is that the person is actually knows, told what's going to happen to them, and they're agreeing to that. So that's sort of the core of what we do. Uh, and this just gives you a lot of the details. And a lot of that is, again, embedded in our regulations. But this is one really, really worth paying attention to, number one in the Nuremberg Code. Uh, here are the rest of the, of the 10. And the only one I'll, I'll point out now is you might look at number five, um, an interesting concept that you shouldn't conduct an experiment where ahead of time you think death or disabling injury might occur, except perhaps where the physicians themselves also serve as subjects. And, so an interesting concept that you might think that might cause the researchers to think twice about whether or not this is the sort of good thing to do if they're going to be subjected to whatever is happening here. So uh, these are very smart people that had a lot of interesting ideas. Okay, so and let me just very briefly go over some other examples. There's the Tuskegee study, a study the U.S. government conducted. Uh, African-American men with uh, syphilis were not treated for years and were not told even that a treatment had been discovered for their problem and was finally exposed after 40 years and provide a major motivation for the rules we now have. Um, there's a study in the Jewish Chronic Disease Hospital where patients were injected with cancer cells, and they weren't told this was being done because people wanted to save them from the anxiety they might otherwise have. Of course, they probably should have been pretty anxious that you know, they were being injected with live cancer cells. Uh, another example, Cincinnati General Hospital in the 1960s, patients with cancer got whole body radiation treatment. Um, and it wasn't as if you know, they didn't necessarily have a focal cancer that could be treated with focal radiation. Instead, they got whole body radiation. And this was at a time when the government was concerned about the effects of the nuclear bomb on you know, soldiers. And so, well, let's see what happens if you're irradiated in a patient's entire body. Um, another example, uh, prisoners were the volunteers here, and they volunteered to have their testicles irradiated. And one of the, the rules uh, in the study, a part of the protocol, was that they had to have a mandatory vasectomy to prevent contamination of the genetic pool. So you irradiated them and then basically forced them to, to undergo the vasectomy so that they couldn't reproduce. So, uh, and, and then there's a slide, and you don't have to read it all now, but bottom line is there were a lot of government projects relating to things that the Soviet and Chinese were doing in terms of looking at brainwashing and interrogation techniques, and the U.S. government was trying to do this too, and subjects were unaware, and some of them that died. So uh, the bottom line is, yes, the Nazis did horrible things, but any government can be prone in some circumstances to do bad things when they're trying to do certain types of research. So in 1979, a document called the Belmont Report was put together, um, and it had three core ethical principles, respect for persons, which is the notion of often the source of autonomy, letting people make their own decisions, informed consent, that sort of thing. Number two, the notion of beneficence, 
often said beneficence, non-maleficence. You want to maximize the benefits from the study and minimize any risks or harms created by doing the study. And third, justice. And so those are the three underlying principles behind our regulations. Um, these principles were then used in regulations that were actually created. Um, there is a thing called the common rule that is the major set of U.S. rules relating to protecting research subjects. And OHRP is the office within Health and Human Services that administers those rules. There's basically a different office in every part of the government that has the reason it's called the common rule is because it's common to many of the different offices, agencies within the federal government. FDA has very, very similar rules, um, but they have different jurisdiction. They have jurisdiction. So on the common rule side, the jurisdiction is due to the government funding these studies. For example, NIH-funded studies come under the common rule. FDA, again, has similar rules, but you're under the FDA rules when you're doing research that's subject to FDA regulation. So it's a device, a drug, a biologic that FDA has the power to decide whether or not it could be approved. And you could be under both sets of rules. They're very similar, but you should pay attention if you're ever doing this type of research. Are you under the common rule? Are you under the FDA rules? If you're under both, you want to know the differences so that you're adhering to both. Um, so now we're getting into institutional review boards. All they are are committees that enforce the rules. And I'll tell you in a we're going to get into it in a couple minutes, what the rules actually are. There are thousands of these committees across the U.S. Some, create, some institutions create their own IRBs, and others hire a private IRB. It's perfectly acceptable to have a private IRB. There are for-profit companies that are IRBs. And, and actually, a lot of the research in, in the U.S. is actually reviewed by some of these private IRBs. Um, there are some rules about how you create an IRB and what it's... You know, um, its procedures have to be, it has to have at least five members. Uh, they have to be diverse in terms of their background. Some of them have to have scientific training. Some have to have non-scientific backgrounds. And I'm only giving some of the rules. Like, again, the rules, quite a few of them. Um, the rules apply to research involving human subjects. Remember, I told you there are defined terms under the rules, so the, the terms I put in green here are the two defined terms, and we already discussed some of this because we were talking about Dr. Rousey and the definition of research. And here is a definition of research. Research means a systematic investigation designed to develop or contribute to generalizable knowledge. So remember our discussions with Dr. Rousey, he was claiming, I didn't do anything systematic, and again, assuming you weren't doing anything systematic, you wouldn't meet this definition. So this is a definition, and you have to be on one side of the definition. You have to be doing research to actually be subject to the rules. Um, now let's look at the other part of the, the, the criteria, which is, again, you have to be using a human subject. So you have to meet both of those to be under the rules. What does it mean to be using a human subject? A human subject is a living individual about whom a researcher gets data through intervention or interaction with the individual. So prong one is the usual thing you probably think about. If you think about doing a clinical trial in which you're going to ask somebody to submit to being randomized to one or another type of treatment, you're clearly interacting and intervening with them. Number two is the part of the rule that some people are less familiar with, which is where a researcher is getting identifiable private information. So you go into the medical records room and pull the charts on a number of people and write down a whole bunch of information about them, including their names and medical record numbers, and you go out of the, the medical record room, room with all of that information. Even though you never met those people, you don't know who they are, you wouldn't know them if you passed them in the street, you're using identifiable private information. You're doing uh, research with a human subject. Uh, notice the limitation. We're talking about living people. If somebody is dead, these rules, the common rule, does not apply to them. It does not apply to deceased individuals, which is not to say there aren't rules relating to that, but they're not part of this rule. And again, we could talk about that if you want. Okay, so now let's assume you're doing research, you met that definition, you're using human subjects. Um, usually, if you meet both of those criteria, you're often, at least in the U.S. rules, going to need a file somewhere relating to what you're doing because I want to just raise the issue. You may have heard about the concept of exempt studies. And even though studies 
there are certain criteria for a study being exempt, which means it's not under the rules. In general, your institution probably has rules saying somebody who knows the rules, some appropriate administrative person, you have to file with them, and they will determine whether or not your study is exempt. So don't assume because you read somewhere that here are some types of studies that could be exempt, that you're good to go, and you could start your study without filing with anybody. Um, what types of studies are exempt? There are six categories of studies that are exempt. Uh, I just want to highlight two of them. What if you're doing questionnaire study? You're a questionnaire, you're talking to people, you're doing a survey, whatever it is. If the study you're doing either is asking innocuous questions, meaning the answers are not going to be harmful to anybody even if they went public. So you're asking people, well, do you think the, it's going to be raining tomorrow or something? And you want to see if some people have a better sense than others of predicting the weather. Obviously, that would not be harmful to them if it went public. Or you could be doing an anonymous study, in which case you could ask you know, questions that would be harmful if the results were out there, but we don't know who the subjects are. So those are, those are exempt studies. And the second category, um, if you're using pre-existing tissue or data, as long as no identifiers or linking lists are kept. So the scenario I talked about where the person goes into the medical records room um, and records a bunch of information on patients, well, if they don't record the medical record numbers or the names of the people, and they can't figure out who the people are, and they just leave the room not having that identifying information, you could be under this exemption category. And a lot of studies are done in that way. Uh, you might have heard about the notion of expedited studies. Uh, for a study to be meeting the definition of being expedited, you have to both be minimal risk and you have to be on a list of certain types of other criteria, specific things are, that are happening in your study. And if that's true, you can go the expedited route. By and large, expedited review means you do not need to have your study reviewed by a whole IRB. It could be reviewed by one person or a couple people from the IRB. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to get an answer sooner. So in many ways, the term expedited isn't perhaps the best term for that. Um, okay, so we've talked about IRBs, um, exemptions, expedited, but we haven't actually talked a lot about, well, how does an IRB determine that a study is approvable? And there are two types of criteria the IRB applies. Um, one is informed consent. And what I encourage you to think about is what I'm telling you here is pretty much revisiting the Nuremberg Code. So the concepts here haven't changed a lot over time. Remember that longish number one slide, the number one prong of the Nuremberg Code. Informed consent, informed consent, informed consent. There are a bunch of rules about getting good, appropriate informed consent. And then number two, there are a bunch of substantive rules about how the study is designed. And that's some of the rules 2 through 10 of the Nuremberg Code. I didn't go through many of those, but those are also rules about the type of study design. Remember Barbara Rojas, again, you know, the woman who lost all the weight. She wasn't in a research study, but getting back to the notion of, in general, consent doesn't provide all the protections you want. Even with consent on the research side, there are a bunch of other rules that we apply to make sure that the studies are appropriate. We don't want people just to consent willy-nilly to any type of study. And let's explore those rules a little bit. So in, in terms of informed consent, you'll get it from each prospective subject or their legally authorized representative if they can't decide for themselves. Usually there's a signed consent form. Usually there's a special consent form for every type of study that explores what happens in that study. The consent has to be voluntary, which means it's free from coercion and undue influence. Um, and these requirements can sometimes be waived. Uh, there are ways an IRB could, in certain instances, conclude in certain low-risk studies, minimal-risk studies, you don't need informed consent. What should a consent form disclose? This is going back to the Nuremberg Code. You want to allow the person to make an enlightened decision. You want to discuss the nature of the person's problem, what will happen to them in the study, the risk from participating in the study, possible benefits from participating, and alternatives to being in the study. These are the most significant things. There are other pieces of information, too. These are real big ticket items. Now let's say a little bit about the substantive rules, because remember, even if somebody consented, that doesn't mean you could do any type of study to them, just so long as they're willing to say, OK, I'm good with that. So what you have to do is, and the IRB is to make these determinations, you have to find that the risks to subjects are minimized, uh, number one, by using procedures consistent with sound research design, not unnecessarily exposing subjects to risks, and number two, 
when it's appropriate, you c it's ideal to use um, subjects who are already getting a particular procedure, not for research purposes, but for clinical purposes. Um, and secondly, and probably this is the biggest rule and, and the most complicated rule in terms of the substantive rules relating to the study, the risks to subjects have to be reasonable in relation to the benefits, if any, to subjects and the importance of the knowledge that may reasonably be expected to result. And this is sort of almost like a, an equation, so let me put it in equation form. It's basically saying that the risks to subjects sort of have to be in the ballpark of something that's a sum of two items. Benefits to subjects plus benefits to society. So note the benefits to society term here. Because of that term, then depending on how big it is, it certainly can be the case that the risks to the subjects can outweigh the benefits to the subjects. And this is again getting back to the theme we laid out from James Rousey's example, that bottom line, we're relaxing the rules about the patient being number one. The rules specifically in the risk-benefit ratio are indicating, yes, you researchers can do things to subjects that are perhaps harmful to them. Now, tricky then in terms of how this rule is applied, and let me just give you a sense of how IRBs often apply it. Um, it's often hard to put a number on the benefits to society from a particular study because uh, often we don't know what the benefits will be. We don't know the answer from the research. That's why we're doing it in the first place. So I think you often see these common IRB behaviors. On the one hand, emphasizing informed consent. And it's really, really important that we get good informed consent and that the subjects really know what they're getting into. We did a really good job about it. And secondly, an IRB will often sort of assume the benefits of society are not huge, in fact, maybe close to zero. And in that case, it sort of becomes, the equation is rewritten to being that the research risks of subjects are kind of not all that different from the benefits of the subjects. Or another way to think about doing, looking at this is, you know, if a study is obvious that it's exposing these subjects to humongous risks, and there are very few benefits on the other side, IRBs are going to be a little wary about approving that kind of study, that there can't be that much of a difference between the risks and the benefits, okay? So most of the non-beneficial studies tend to be not all that risky, because IRBs probably are uncomfortable about this equation otherwise. Um, some other substantive rules, you want equitable selection of subjects. This means certain groups should not bear more than share of the research risks. But also, and this is important to not forget, they, you want to make sure they're included enough so that they get their share of the benefits. So often, for example, this is a, a debate that occurs in terms of uh, women being in research studies, that we're not so much worried about you know, they're being in the studies and being exposed to risks inappropriately, but that not being in the studies and therefore not knowing how to do appropriate treatments, how to provide them with appropriate medical care. So a, a difficult balance there in terms of, but keep both ideas in, in mind. Um, special rules relating to subjects that are vulnerable to coercion or undue influence. Uh, coercion is sort of uh, where you're sort of threatening to take away some right somebody has and says, well, if you don't enroll in the study, I'm going to make sure no doctor will treat you or that sort of stuff. Undue influence is more too much of a good thing. Well, I'll pay you a massive amount of money to get you into the study. So if subjects vulnerable to those sorts of things, and here's a list of types of subjects that are often considered vulnerable, there are additional safeguards. Uh, gets kind of complicated in terms of some specific safeguards for some categories and others there are no specific safeguards spelled out. Um, additional protections needed with regard to privacy and confidentiality of data uh, where that's appropriate. Um, now I sort of told you well this is a system we have. A lot of debate about whether the system is good, is it too strict, is it too lax, um, and you're actually living at a time now where there's a major endeavor to rewrite the rules in a variety of ways. Uh, there's a document that came out just this past September that the federal government is proposing to rewrite the rules in a variety of ways, and here's a link to what's happening. In fact, the common period in this proposal just closed uh, January 6th. Um, there are a lot of comments out there. You could actually read all of the public comments. Uh, over 2,000 of them are there. And now the government's going to look at all those comments and analyze them and decide what it wants to do. So kind of interesting if you're interested in this field. Uh, that's the end of the talk. Um, open for any questions. So.
No questions? Do have a question, okay? Okay, so the question is, if there are for-profit IRBs, who pays for them? How do you remove the conflict of interest there? Uh, a great question, something that is significantly debated. It, it's, generally, the fees are paid by the entity that is hiring them to review the study. And as you indicate, somebody might say, well, gee, that sounds like it creates a conflict, because if you're the for-profit IRB, you want these institutions, like a, a medical center or a university, to keep paying you, and presumably they're going to keep hiring you and paying you if you come out with outcomes that they want, and presumably the outcome they want is, what a wonderful study. This meets all the rules. We're going to approve it instantly, or whatever it is. Uh, that is a conflict. Um, and, and people then debate, well, Let's look at the alternative, which is often these IRBs that are part of institutions. So NIH has a bunch of IRBs. Pick whatever illustrious university you want. They often have a lot of internal IRBs. And those IRBs are often composed, most of the people on those IRBs are actually people who work at that institution. There's a requirement that there be some outside person, but often there's only one of those among, let's say, 10 or more IRB members. And so the, the argument has been, well, often those IRBs have a certain incentive. They're, often there are other researchers who are on their IRB review panels, and they're thinking, well, gee, I want my institution to continue receiving research money, to continue receiving the wonderful grants from NIH and other entities that, that sponsor research. So the people People in that IRB, precisely because they're part of that institution, might be trying to make sure the studies get approved. So you're balancing one type of conflict which occurs in a private IRB versus concerns about another type of conflict which might be occurring in the in-house IRB. Um, I think the studies out there thus far have not, there aren't a lot of studies that compare the two types of IRBs and look at how good a job they do and how independent they are, whatever it is. Um, it's tricky. I mean, they're good issues. You raised a very good issue in terms of the private IRBs. And again, the evidence out there is not that the private IRBs are doing a particularly worse job in terms of being independent and doing an appropriate thing than the in-house IRBs. Um, Again, partly this gets back to to be a private IRB and to continue to get at the business. You do have to generate a reputation that you're kind of doing the right thing, because otherwise it will look bad for you know famous university hires you to be the IRB uh, if everybody in the field knows, gee, you're a sloppy IRB and you don't do a good job. In fact, one private IRB, there were hearings in 2009 where there was a sting operation. In fact, my office was targeted in addition to a bunch of other entities. But one private IRB approved what was a fake study that, that the GAO concocted. And there's actually a video of the hearings about this if you want to watch it. You can hear about the three-legged dog named Trooper and how Trooper the dog was actually a member of one of the IRBs and things like this. And that IRB basically it went out of business after that precisely because its reputation was so shattered by people hearing that it was so incompetent that it proved this study. Nobody, you know, it wasn't like everybody was flocking to it. How? Hey, there's this wonderful IRB that will improve it. any study, rather just the opposite. Nobody legitimate was willing to, to go to them anymore. So it's a great issue. It continues to be debated. Nobody has the perfect way of kind of, you know, whether it's in-house or, or private IRBs to... Yes? What if, uh, does an IRB always have a consensus? What if some of the members within the IRB disagree? Yeah, okay. So the question is, uh, is there always a consensus in terms of an IRB's decision? And what if, if people disagree? Um, it, it's certainly a good thing to aim for a consensus. And depending on how far away you are from a consensus, that certainly could be troubling to an IRB. So often IRBs will try to kind of discuss things until they, they deal with the concerns, sort of like juries, right? Uh, try to kind of get everybody on board on, on one side of the thing. Um, there's no requirement that, that there be a full consensus. And there are scenarios in which one or a number of the IRB members will, in fact, disagree with the IRB determination. But the IRB determination will still stand. 
And again, the IRB may take that into account and may think about why that's happening. Is it a different view of the facts? Uh, but that certainly, it's interesting when there isn't a consensus, and, and you kind of want to pay a lot of attention to the people who aren't signing on to the consensus. And of course, it could depend on what direction the non-signer honors are kind of going, as opposed to what the majority of the IRB is saying. Uh, more commonly, it will probably be people who are probably wanting to change the study or not approve it in the current form, because by and large, over enough time, most the great majority of studies are approved as long as the researcher is willing to work with the IRB. Yeah, you had a is quick there, follow up. Uh, is there a waiver or a, a, a challenge? Uh, are you talking about whether the researcher could challenge? Either the researcher or the general public or anybody? Yeah. Else? Okay, um, so the question is, is there some way to challenge IRB determinations? And this was actually one of the things asked about in, as part of earlier stages of the Notice of Proposed Rulemaking. Uh, some people were asking for formal appeal procedures. And there aren't any required by the rules right now. Institutions can certainly implement them if they want, and often the way that happens is that you would have the right to a researcher, for example, to go back to the IRB and, and challenge the determination and talk with them and that sort of thing. Or some institutions will allow it to be bounced to another IRB in that institution. But again, that's dependent on the institution in terms of whether it wants to implement that sort of thing. There isn't a required appeal procedure, and certainly there are investigators who will say that's not a fair part of the system. Uh, do we have another question? Yeah, way back there. Okay, so you're some private, small private entity um, and you want to choose a private IRB and you want to figure out how do you choose a good one. Um, I would suggest you probably should be talking with people, researchers out there who've sort of dealt with the private IRBs out there because um, there aren't actually a huge number of them and some of them are actually quite large and therefore there's, again, it, it's, it's sort of one of these things, right, you've got to talk to people in the field because there are reputations that the IRBs have. Obviously, if you're going with a very, very large one, there happens to be one called Western IRB, which is huge. Um, and again, there's certainly a lot of information out there that, you know, lots of other entities out there, including major universities left and right, are using that IRB, and I'm not picking on them, they just happen to be larger, but they're many other IRBs that are private and are pretty large. So again, I would encourage you to kind of, you have to talk probably to people, other institutions that use private IRBs. You'd probably want to find an, a major university. You'd, you'd want to talk to the IRBs and have them give you a list of their clients, and you may want to talk to some of their clients. So there are ways to find out information about you know, what the differences are in terms of how these IRBs function, and there are a lot of differences. So, but it's a good question. Sure, okay, so raise a good question, right. Are you doing international research? You're doing different kind of research? Yes, different IRBs will have different facilities. They may be, you know, probably the smallest ones are probably not gonna be best for international research because they may not have an ability to, to you know, Maybe they need to send somebody over to the, the site where the study is taking place or something. So absolutely, it could be that different IRBs review different types of research. Absolutely. I mean, the bigger ones are more likely to be reviewing lots of different types of research. Some of the narrower ones, the smaller ones, may be more restrictive in terms of what types of research they review. Um, other questions? Okay, well, thank you very much.